Welcome back, June 23rd, 2021. Thank you to Dr. J.D. Hayworth for filling in while I was out. Much of the left and many Democratic Party operatives want Justice Stephen Breyer nominated to the Supreme Court by President Bill Clinton, age 83 this year. Much and many want him to retire post-haste. Why? So that Joe Biden can replace him, obviously, with a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court before Republicans, perchance, take back the Senate. Reading a decision of his issued this morning, I almost wonder if the left and the Democratic Party have other motives for wanting Stephen Breyer retired. The left and Democratic Party today do not any longer support freedom of speech or the First Amendment. Stephen Breyer, a throwback to the liberalism of Joe Lieberman and Alan Dershowitz, perhaps even Bill Maher these days, Stephen Breyer does support the First Amendment and free speech. In an opinion he wrote and uh, issued this morning and joined by such justices as Kavanaugh, Barrett, and Gorsuch, Stephen Breyer held up the wide-ranging speech claims of a high school student, a school, a public high school, had punished for her speech, in this case, an Instagram post given or sent off campus. And what Justice Breyer said of free speech rights at public schools, which are perforce less protected than free speech rights elsewhere and of adults, was this. A message that should be fired off to every good and committed Democrat. Quote, schools have an interest in protecting a student's unpopular expression, especially when the expression takes place off campus. America's public schools are the nurseries of democracy. Our representative democracy only works if we protect the marketplace of ideas. This free exchange facilitates an informed public opinion, which, when transmitted to lawmakers, helps produce laws that reflect the people's will. That protection must include the protection of unpopular ideas, for popular ideas have less need for protection, close quote. He would later go on, thus schools have a strong interest in ensuring that future generations understand the workings in practice of the well-known aphorism, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Citing a long train of cases, Justice Breyer wrote, the First Amendment protects even hurtful speech, quote, on public issues to ensure that we do not stifle public debate, and quote, the inappropriate character of a statement is irrelevant to the question whether it deals with a matter of public concern, close quote. Justice Breyer, send your opinion to every social media company, please, and public university. Or as a cynic might say, you've done high school students, now do college, and the former president of the United States. Justice Alito wrote a concurrence, and maybe Justice Breyer's staff can enclose his concurrence too and send it to the panjandrums at Facebook and Twitter. Citing further precedents, he wrote, quote, It is a bedrock principle that speech may not be suppressed simply because it expresses ideas that are offensive or disagreeable. Speech may not be banned on the ground that it expresses ideas that offend. The fact that society may find speech offensive is not a sufficient reason for suppressing it, nor may speech be curtailed because it invites dispute, creates dissatisfaction with conditions the way they are, or even stirs people to anger. And finally... It is firmly settled that under our Constitution, the public expression of ideas may not be prohibited merely because the ideas are themselves offensive to some of their hearers. Again, this is all in the service of protecting a teenager's speech, in this case, teenager's vulgar, non-political speech. As I say, now do Donald Trump, social media, and public universities. None of these are today's left and Democratic Party values especially on matters that matter most, matters of the most crucial import, particularly having to do with issues of race and, in some cases, election integrity, the voting right. Today, the relativists of yesterday are now actually so certain of certain truths they are willing to censor, cancel, and physically assault those who deviate from the party line. As Alan Dershowitz, who used to sit on the board of directors of the ACLU and left when they left their mission, said the problem is these young professionals today don't understand that without basic liberties, every would-be utopia 
becomes a dystopia. They don't understand what the great Justice Louis Brandeis said a century ago. Quote, experience should teach us to be most on our guard to protect liberty when the government's purposes are beneficent. Men born to freedom are naturally alert to repel invasion of their liberty by evil-minded rulers. The greatest dangers to liberty lurk in insidious encroachments by men of zeal, well-meaning, but without understanding. Nor do they understand what, Justice Jernid, ju what Judge Learned Hand said, that the spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it is right, it is the spirit which seeks to understand the minds of other men and women. It is the spirit which weighs their interests alongside its own without bias. When I read reread that Brandeis quote, men born to freedom are naturally alert to repel invasion of their liberty by evil-minded rulers, I was thinking of the entirety of the last year and a half. What of the not evil-minded rulers? What um, about the natural alertness to repel invasions of liberties? by beneficent rulers. Well, C.S. Lewis had it when he wrote, of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It would be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral busybodies. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity may at some points be satiated. But those who torment us for our own good will torment us without any end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. They may be more likely to go to heaven, yet at the same time likelier to make a hell on earth. This very kindness stings with intolerable insult. To be cured against one's will and cured of states which we may not regard as diseased is to be put on a level of those who have not yet reached the age of reason or those who never will, to be classified with infants, imbeciles, and domestic animals. Close quote. Now, just before C.S. Lewis gets into this in his book, God in the Dock, he echoes something we spoke about last week, the Aristotelian distinctions between a good man and a good regime, and a good man and a bad regime, and a bad man and a good regime, and a bad man and a good regime, uh, and, a, and a good man and a bad regime, etc. Lewis wrote, good men who abandon the thought of good and evil intentions can act as cruelly and unjustly as the greatest of tyrants, they might in respects even act worse. As you who listen to Dennis Prager well know, the Talmud speaks of he who has mercy on the cruel being one day cruel unto the merciful. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, mercy detached from justice grows unmerciful. That is the important paradox. As there are plants which will flourish only in a mountain soil, so it will appear that mercy will flower only when it grows in the crannies of the rock of justice. Transplanted to the marshlands of mere humanitarianism, it becomes a man-eating weed, all the more dangerous because it is still called by the same name as the mountain variety. But we ought to long ago have learned our lesson. We should be too old now to be deceived by those pretensions which have served to usher in every cruelty of the revolutionary period in which we live, close quote. That is the abandonment of true mercy. Now, notice I've taken up the absurd social media posts of a teenager's rights to just about the largest topics in a society today, good and bad, right and wrong, those tricky distinctions again. But the sophomore may ask, how do we decide what is right and wrong? What Sheldon Whitehouse thinks is right is not what I do. Aha. And there, there right there is the beginning of the reason for freedom of speech, to discuss the greatest and important issues, to hammer them out, to battle them out, like Socrates, but without the death sentence. Do recall, by the way, how Socrates was charged for capital punishment? Corruption of the youth was the charge. Are those engaged in the silencing business now also the self-same who are protecting the youth, by the way? Or is that completely upside down, too? Anti-racist baby and Netflix and the Cartoon Network and the BLM curriculum and the pairings of all these with transgender instruction to elementary and kindergarten students. Are they on the cancel culture side, those folks, or the freedom of speech side? Interesting question. You know the answer. 
And the reason is because of what they are afraid of taking place right now. Parents waking up, exercising First Amendment rights, and attending school board meetings and speaking out loudly. This is the worst thing a Marxist movement can have, which is why Marxist movements do not tolerate freedom of speech for those that don't agree with the party in line. Because the neo-Marxist curriculum today does not stand on its own and does not stand up to any kind of serious scrutiny in a country that claims to venerate freedom and equality, because of this, opposition has to, must be silenced. Do recall that one BLM curricular point we found so interesting. Quote, we are unapologetically black in our positioning, and in affirming that black lives matter, we need not qualify our position, close quote. Never mind what it means to be black in positioning. I'm just assuming it doesn't mean what Clarence Thomas or Larry Alder or Shelby Steele or Thomas Sowell or Ben Carson think it is. But the needing not qualify our position, understand, is a peremptory silencing of questioning or criticism of speech or debate. We need not qualify our position. Accept it. It is truth. Ex cathedra. Giants of liberalism used to stalk this land. So did the notion of freedom and equality. It is firmly settled that under our Constitution, the public expression of ideas may not be prohibited merely because the ideas are themselves offensive to some of these hearers, Justice John Harlan wrote. The sentiment still runs throughout and through injustice Stephen Breyer today, and that, I think, is why they on the left really want him gone. The theology of the day, and it is rapidly becoming a theology, is that we must not debate you. We must silence you. And Stephen Breyer doesn't agree. Thus, he must go. I'm Seth Leapson. We'll be right back. <laughs> 